love is a seed. When one seed of some small flower, let us call the one of we, is hurled out from the waters of its roiling mother sea, the seed afloat how it listens to a thousand sounds beyond, until eventual arrival into the weight of mother's arms, saying, here I am to all the earth, waiting for the songs of afterbirth. We all hope and we sing, let the blooming begin. O oh, little seed now can examine and take the new world wide in with so much of life that now comes spinning and surrounds around its newborn feet and stems. Oh, how the little seed does in earnest reach its mouth to mother to cry, to sing, to coo, hoping to receive her love and the longed for tending to. We all hope and we sing, let the blooming begin. After many a fall and rise of the constant moon and sun, little seeds new stem so high while leaves stretch wide to everyone. Little seeds mass of brilliance makes the world pause to catch its waiting bated breath while love pours out like the rain pours down like a wild welcome deluge that brings the water to nurture another soon to arrive from the sea of a mother one more time we hope and we sing, let the blooming begin. And that is for you and what blooming, what blooming will begin here. And so Alan had uh, decided uh, that he wanted to come and share a special program to his heart uh, at this time. And he will tell you more about it. Um, and it is uh, just in one sense, as I quote him, remembering and honoring the courage, compassion, and transformation of all the people of Rwanda on its 25th anniversary of tragic genocide. And we are going to hear words of art from Alan and his friends. And I will uh, very briefly introduce uh, who we have here, including Adrian Williams uh, at the far end. And uh, what I understand, I did not, um, I do not have a bio, but I know Ellen said, oh, Adrienne's been all over the world and she has done so much good work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> that, this is what I hear, Adrienne. <laughs> for children in particular and for uh, people and also is a singer and an artist. Um, so we welcome you, Adrienne. And, uh, for uh, Dylan Cuddy, I have heard of Dylan. I'm going off strict script here, Alan. Is that okay? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Dylan, I have heard about uh, for years, uh, the special friend he is to Alan um, and how he has joined him with storytelling and some music and uh, banjo on occasion. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, some banjo magic there and uh, these very special walks that he takes on behalf of uh, us all. Uh, so welcome, and uh, and we have Dot Walsh, Walsh over here, and uh, Dot Walsh I, I met at the uh, Peace Abbey in Sherborne, where I met Alan as well, and Dot was the uh, wonderful chaplain there for many years and of peace, and she continues to be chaplain of peace to our world, and is host of Oneness and Wellness, and author of a wonderful book as well. Um, and many other many other things for all people, but I'm off script people. So, <laughs> and I have Mark Lipman here, who I have heard at an event of Alan's uh, with a beautiful voice, and he is a singer songwriter, and he performs with a band as well as a beautiful solo work, and uh, had his education at the Leslie uh, University Expressive Therapies program. So. There you go, a little bit of a story, and Alan is going to serve as Shanaki and facilitator of this and tell you the story beyond. So I'd like to ask you all to please give a warm welcome to all our friends here today. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome. Uh, this is us, all of us. It's, we're here sharing stories. We'll be sharing some of them and the theme of today is about Rwanda. This is its 25th anniversary. And it's, uh, ah, Rwanda. There are so many images about what 
Rwanda is, who the Ro people from Rwanda are. And we have it imprinted on our minds because it's been on the news over the years when, it, when the, the genocide happened, but that's not only who the people of Rwanda are. They are much, much, much more. They teach us about life. In the, in the circle in Rwanda, they call it gachacha, where people gather on the lawn. And in, that, in the time of sitting on the lawn, is what you do is you share the stories of your life, but also you tell it with honesty. It's not a time to make up the lies or anything like that. It's a time of truth. And what we're here to do today is to share the truth of our experience of what we've learned about Rwanda and what we're still learning about Rwanda. For me, it was be, began with this young man, Hippolyte Nagora from uh, Rwanda, who came over to UMass Boston to study on a special doctoral program. And he, he chose me to be his guide for the next year as he did his writing and working and all that. And it was transformational. It changed my whole life being with him. First time I met him, it was in South Boston and uh, at a school that I was consulting to. And we took a walk around the streets of South Boston, Hippolyte and myself. And it was just, he greeted everybody he saw. People sitting out on their lawn chairs was a summer day. And he would take them by hand and say, nice to meet you. And I'm thinking, this is South Boston. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it's very pretty. I like it. <laughs> and, he, and by the time the walk was over, he had all these people talking to him. And he does, that's what he does. He talks to everybody. He brings his heart. And I said, this is wonderful. And he said, that's who we are. That's what got lost so many years ago, 25 years ago. This is who we are. This is J.P. Bear, by the way. So J.P. is also has many things to say. And so as you look in on this, you can listen to what he has to say as well. Uh, J.P. is now 44 years old, and he has many stories to tell in all the places we've been. But I'll begin by just simply saying our true home is in the present moment. To live in the present moment is a miracle. The miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on the green earth in the present moment, to appreciate the peace and beauty that are available right now. Peace is all around us, in the world, and in nature, and within us, in our bodies and our spirits. Once we learn to touch this peace, we will be healed and transformed. It is not a matter of faith. It is a matter of practice. Every day we get up, and it's a matter of practice, recognizing that our true home is in the present moment. And each person that we encounter and experience and see are our teachers, including those things that we don't want to learn or make us angry. But our true home is in the present moment. And so today, what I would like to invite all of us to remember is this. <laughs> Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. <laughs> so if you live with that, then there will be a sharing of that. And that's what the people of Rwanda taught me and taught a lot of us. It's like, be yourself. Everyone else is all taken, already taken. Because people were like getting on top of each other and there was a hierarchy and all of that. And when the, the genocide came to an end, it was like there was no more uh, Hutus and Tutsis. It was like we are all Rwandans. That was the new president. That's what he brought. We are all Rwandans. We are all sisters and brothers sitting here today, listening and being with each other. So thank you for joining us. And afterwards, we'll just talk more and more and more. And each of you 
will share your stories. The stories of Rwanda that went, burnt to the ashes, one million people killed in 100 days. And they, those one million people, are still alive, teaching us about our true home is in the present moment. And each person we encounter, including those people that we don't like, are part of our home. And our task is to learn how to live with those people in our home. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> I also want to thank Cheryl and everyone here at the television station for helping out, for Adrian, Dylan, Alan, my love, Mark, and Hippolyte out there somewhere. And uh, we're remembering, as Alan said, we're remembering the people of Rwanda, those who are deceased and those who are still living. So we're here to honor them and to hold them in our hearts. I am you, and you are me. We are one people in one world. Remembering. The stone and the casing were packed on the side of the hill, right near the guest house. The memorial stone is the stone that honors all people killed in war. And it's been many places, on many roads, in many countries, and it's held many spirits. The Benevikira sisters came out from the guest house, one by one, single file. These were the Catholic sisters from Rwanda who helped during the genocide. They came out and they placed their hands on the stone and everyone was quiet. There was a moment of stillness. And then Alan led us all in a ritual that brought us together as people, you know, coming together during this ceremony, honoring the sisters. The sisters received the Courage of Conscience Award. I'll read you what was said to them that day. You're receiving the Courage of Conscience Award for the compassion, voices, and work in caring for and sheltering the victims of the genocide in Rwanda in, in 1994. Remembering. And then the Rusa Sabaginas, Paul and Tassiana, came one evening. The stone was out on the caisson outside of the Peace Abbey. And once again, they told us the stories, the pain, the horror they experienced opening the doors of the hotel, listening to the stories that were chilling, trying to provide sanctuary for some people and turning others away. They received the Courage of Conscience Award for their extraordinary efforts that saved the lives of over 1,200 innocent people. Maya Angelou wrote a, wrote a piece that was to be read that evening, but she couldn't attend. And so I asked my friend Andrea Campbell if she would come and she would read the piece, which she did. She memorized it. And she had already met Maya Angelou when she was a little girl at the Peace Abbey. And Maya Angelou said to her, you are my aunt, so when I pass, you will have my spirit. So this uh, Andrea Campbell read those words that night, and now she is reading her own words because she is the council chairperson for the Boston City Council. So she is using her voice to share words with the people of Boston and they're very strong words you might hear on the radio.
And then I had the wonderful experience of meeting Hippoly. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. I said, I'll meet you at the station. He got off the train, and we ran towards each other, and we <laughs> hugged each other because he is a hugger. <laughs> <laughs> And he was beautiful. Then he came to the to my program, to the station, the television station, and he told his stories, and it was so heart wrenching. But once again, he his faith, his hope, extends out to everyone that he meets. Painful yet hopeful. And then I saw Hippolyte again when Alan did a wonderful program at Tufts. And it was with the students there. And Hippolyte, there was a play, and he told his story along with the other students. And once again, I was so moved by his sincerity, by his kindness, by his faith, you know, and his hope that, you know, even though he's telling this painful, painful story, he had that hope within him. So now these two men, Dylan and Hippolyte are going on this journey, this amazing journey for this 25th anniversary, and they'll be walking together, and they'll be walking with lots of other people. And it is a journey. It's a journey of faith. It's a journey of hope. There will be painful moments. There will be tears. There will be remembering. And then there will be, once again, the hope that comes from a loving God who tells us all that we can live together in peace. I am you, and you are me. We are one people in one world. And I'd like to close with a poem that was written by Dan Berrigan, Father Dan Berrigan, when he came to the Life Experience School in the Peace Abbey. And I think it speaks to, to the journey that Dylan and Hippolyte will be on. Some stood up once and sat down. Some walked a mile and walked away. Some stood up twice, then sat down. I've had it, they said. Some walked two miles, then walked away. It's too much, they cried. Some stood and stood and stood. They were taken for fools. They were taken for being taken in. Some walked and walked and walked. They walked the earth. They walked the waters. They walked the air. Why do you stand, they were asked. And why do you walk? Because of the children, they said, and because of the heart, and because of the bread. Because the cause is the heart's beat, and the children born, and the risen bread. Thank you, Dan. Hello, everybody. My name is Dylan Cuddy. Um, I guess I would consider myself an amateur adventurist and a storyteller, much like everyone gathered here today. Um, in 2016, I walked across the United States of America. Uh, I didn't really have a plan, I just had a general idea. You know, I had a foundation laid and uh, took an Amtrak train from Providence, Rhode Island to Jacksonville Beach, Florida in uh, last week of February. Had a backpack on my shoulders and sandals on my feet. And uh, we were going to visit cathedrals across the United States. That was, that was my plan, um, <coughs> contemplating the mercy of God. Um, my first few days on the road, I met, I was at a McDonald's, I remember, and I was charging my phone. And then walked this little scrubby looking, you know, homeless person. And he walked up to me, he started talking to me. And, hey, how you doing? My name's, my name's uh, Scott, you know. And I was just kind of looking at him and I judged him. I said, ah. I'm traveling, but I don't know. I don't trust this person. I, I might not want to interact with them. I'm just going to stay reserved to myself. And he sat across the booth from me, and he asked to use my cell phone charger. And I said, "Well, I'm using mine." And well, 
let's give Scott the charger, you know, let's take a leap of faith there. So I gave him my cell phone charger and then in walks uh, Susie and Zach and they walk in, they sit down and they're, they're homeless too. You can, you can just tell there's a, there's a vibe there, you know, hot day in the sun. They come into McDonald's into the AC just to shoot the breeze and unwind and, you know, get off the street. And uh, Zach looked at me and he said, oh, Scott's using your phone charger. I have an extra one here. I have this one. So then Scott, uh, sorry, Zach gave me his phone charger. And then Susie saying, man, I was just at the, uh, the mission, you know, the shelter. And they say they're a Christian shelter, but they wouldn't give me a Bible. I really wanted the Bible and they wouldn't give me one. And I said, well, Susie, I have a Bible if you want one. And she goes, no, no, it's fine. You keep it. I said, no, 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 please, you know, take this Bible. So I gave her the Bible. And I'm sitting there in this moment and I realized, well, I gave Scott something. Zach gave me something. And I gave Susie something. And we're just there helping each other. And like I said, it was one of the first few days on the road, and I immediately knew this is going to be a journey of interacting with people, helping one another, and uh, being amongst the homeless. Fast forward to Houston a few months later, you know, thick of summer, I, I roll into town, I'm, I'm looking like a homeless person. You know, I have a, a, a baby stroller, a buggy filled with uh, odds and ends, and, you know, clothes on my back, sunburn, a little bit of water. <laughs> And uh, money that people have been giving me along the way. People would just pull over on the roadside as I was walking. They would give me food, water, shelter. Everything was provided for me. I didn't have to go out and get it. It was just given. And uh, I, I roll into Houston, and I'm just fatigued. And I said, man, I really want a meal. And I, I just said this, I guess, a prayer to the great beyond. I just said, I want to help someone. So I start, I turn the corner downtown. I see Buffalo Wild Wings. I said, well, let me go get a meal. And. I see a drug deal go down right outside the Buffalo Wild Wings. It's, uh, you know, two drug dealers. They're exchanging, you know, thick wads of cash, you know, giving each other handshakes and standing on the corner. And I said, well, I'm not going to help those people, you know. So, but they looked at me, they noticed me, and I, I went right into the Buffalo Wild Wings. I put my, my baby stroller in the lobby, just left it there, went and sat down. And uh, while well, I'm waiting in line to sit down. And then one of the drug dealers came storming into the Buffalo Wild Wings, comes right up to me, and he goes, hey, man, I need you to help me. I go, what's going on? He goes, man, I don't know. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know what's going on. And he was just delirious. He had tears coming down his face. I go, slow down. I go, slow down. What's going on? And he goes, man, he goes, how did I even get in here? He goes, how did I get in here? He goes, I'm not allowed to be in here. And I go, well, you just came running in here, and you came directly up to me and asked for help, and I don't know, I don't know why you're in here. And he goes, man, he goes, I'm not allowed to be in here. I go, well, you know, let's sit down. Let's get a meal, so. I go over to the hostess. I said, we're going to sit down and get a meal if that's okay. They said, okay. So we sit down. And I go, what's your name? He goes, Staples. I go, all right, Staples. Um, and he just looks at me in the eyes and he goes, why are you doing this for me? Why are you helping me? Why are you giving me the meal? And I said, well, I don't know. I figured you might know. You came right up to me and asked for help. I figured it was, it was mine to give. And he looks at me right in the eyes. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm looking like a, like a hobo. I had a big beard, long hair, you know, like tan, sunburned skin. And he looks at me and he goes, are you Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm not Jesus. You know, but I'd like to think that I know him in a certain way. And, and he goes, man, he goes, it's been really hard out here on the street. He goes, I'm ready to change my life. I just, I want, I want to get over this. I don't want to be living on the street anymore. He goes, my friends are alcoholics. They're dying on the streets. He goes... I, I try to give them food. They won't even eat because they're just drinking so much. They're sick. And he goes, I'm going to change my life. He looks at me and he goes, he goes Dylan, because I told him that my name. He goes, Dylan, he goes, thank you for helping me. He goes, I'm going to change my life. He goes, I got a job interview this weekend. And he, he, he laid it all out, how he's going to change his life and get off the streets. And so I reach into my little my pack there and some of the money that people have given me, I gave to Staples. And I just said, here, you know, you need this more than me. And he looked down and he, and he was so confused. He goes, why are you helping me? I go, I don't know, it just seems like the right thing to do. So I pretty much gave him all the money that I had, and I just, uh, we got up, we finished our meal, I gave him a couple of meals to go, walked outside, I walk up to my baby stroller in the lobby, bring it outside, and he looks at me, and he stops, and he goes, is this all you have? And I said, yeah, this is all I have. And he goes, you're homeless? I go, well, yeah, I guess so, I guess I am homeless. You know, I'm living on the street, I'm going across the country, and, and then he just started, he started crying and he said, never again. I'm never going to live this way again. And then he went off into the street. I'm walking around a few blocks later and I hear him. It was as if he was preaching. As if he was a preacher. And he was saying, we don't have to live this way. We don't have to live on the street. You know. 
And it was just kind of just this interaction mm-hmm. that manifested itself. And that's life on the road, you know. Fast forward to a few months later, I'm in the desert, um, California, 100 miles from Parker, Arizona to 29 Palms. I had seven and a half gallons I ventured into the desert with, and it was almost quickly gone. I only had a gallon left, and I still had 75 miles to go. I didn't know how I was going to make it to the desert in August. It was Mojave Desert, and uh, very few cars were going up and down that road. And uh, hmm. I saw a storm cloud off into the distance. You know, I was sleeping under railroad tracks, you know, on the desert floor hanging my hammock beneath the, uh, the beams. And I saw a storm cloud way off in the mountains, and I just thought, man, it'd be sure nice if that storm cloud came this way and you know, dropped a little rain. And uh, you would be careful what you ask for, because <laughs> probably about a few hours later, just as the sun went down and you know, evening is setting in, the storm cloud, it, it just came rolling in. It just steamrolled in like a train, you know? And it just started pouring water down on me. And I had my tarp, and I was trying to gather it. Sand was going everywhere. And, Finally, I, uh, I, I managed to get one gallon filled of dirty water. And I said, well, I can probably mechanically filter it with some mosquito netting that I have and drop some iodine tablets in there and see what I can do. And that had been given to me you know, by a guy named Roger in Phoenix, Arizona. So the next day I get up contemplating, is it safe to drink this water, all these things. And half mile up the road, quarter mile up the road, this vehicle pulls over, starts waving. Gets out, opens their trunk, and drops three gallons of water down onto the desert floor, points to it, waves to me, and then drives off into the distance. And that's all I needed. That three, three gallons got me to the next town. And uh, shortly after completing my trek from Florida to, to California in 2016, Alan introduced me to uh, Hippolyte virtually through email. And Hippolyte said, you know, I, I want to walk across my country too. You know, I want to do it for the 25th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. I said, well, one of the things that I found difficult, Hippolyte, was uh, documenting the experience on my own. You know, I didn't have someone there for me to take pictures and video and to share my story with the world and the, the beautiful interactions I had <laughs> with people. You know, they, I wasn't able to capture them as much as I would have liked. And uh, he goes, well, Dylan, you know, I don't have the funding for someone like that. And I said, well, Hippolyte, you know, um, if you want, I can be that person for you, you know. I can take on that role. I can take that delegated task to be your photographer, you know, your videographer, your uh, journaler, you know, sort of your documenting, you know, the experience. And he said, I, I would really like that, Dylan. Thank you so much. And then he invited me to Rwanda. 